Welcome and thanks for pressing play. This episode of Wardox was made possible by a partnership with the Defense Strategies Institute's OpMed TV and was recorded at the 2024 Operational Medicine Symposium in San Antonio. These interviews focus on optimizing military medicine through the modernization and implementation of policies, education, training, research, and development. We also explore emerging technologies to enhance the health, strength, and survivability of warfighters. Welcome to this special episode of War Docs in partnership with OpMed TV. Today we're talking with Colonel Dr. Jennifer Gurney. She's a trauma surgeon and currently the chief of the Joint Trauma System. So welcome to the, the show. Thanks, Dr. Sodal. It's good to see you. You can call me Doug. Okay, we, we thanks, know, Doug. We, <laughs> we have known each other for a while. Yeah. <laughs> so, so tell me a little bit about what, what led you to Army medicine. How did you get involved in the first place? So I really had no um, long-term intention of being an Army doctor, Army yeah. surgeon. I joined, I was at Boston University for medical school, taking out a massive amount of loans. Uh, found out I could get some help from Army, Navy, or Air Force, applied for Army, Navy, and Air Force scholarships, and got all three and chose the Army. I, because I'd heard of Walter Reed and I'd heard of Brooke, so I cho chose the Army and trained at Walter Reed. During my training was 2001, September 11, 2001, and I think that you know changed a lot of people's lives in the world and it changed the course of my career. You got some of your loans repaid or you took a scholarship? How did that yeah, work? Yeah, HPSP scholarship. HPSP. So I took the HPSP scholarship uh, at BU, at the three-year scholarship, and then, uh, and yeah, that, that's how I, yeah. So why, why surgery and why specifically trauma surgery? Well, surgery, because I loved it. I, there, was no, there was no close second when I went through medical school rotations. You remember all those rotations? And uh, there was no close second. I remember, you know, this is pre 80 hour work week, giving it a lot of thought. And uh, is this something I wanted to really dedicate my life to? And it was. And I was a general surgeon for about 10 years, deployed a lot as a general surgeon. And when I was at Lawn Stool as a chief of general surgery, I found that I was taking care of a lot of combat casualties every day. It was when we were really busy with uh, uh, the op tempo in Iraq and Afghanistan. And I thought I'd be more effective if I was a trauma surgeon, even though as a general surgeon, I was doing a lot of trauma. And so then went to fellowship about 10 years after being a general surgeon, was so fortunate, got to spend a year at Stanford for surgical critical care, and then go up to San Francisco General Hospital for trauma and for some uh, research mentorship. So does the Army let you go and do these type of fellowships? How do, they, how do you get that opportunity? The Army has a lot of opportunities. Timing is important. Uh, and I think that uh, Dr. Brian Easters was a trauma consultant at the time. And I think because I had you know, done, my, done my fair share of stuff, he was uh, amenable to letting me have a flexible fellowship for two years. You know, a lot of times people just do a one-year fellowship. I really wanted to do two years, and I really wanted to do it outside of the military to round out my experience. And, you know, I, I don't know if I could have gotten a better experience in surgical critical care than what you get at Stanford. And I'm not sure if you can get much of a better trauma experience than what you get at San Francisco General Hospital. So I was really lucky with my training and I'm, I'll be forever grateful for that. So I think most of our listeners would say, yeah, trauma surgeon makes sense in the military, but where would you find a trauma surgeon on the battlefield? That's a good question. I think that that question's actually evolving a little bit because there's surgery, you know, the technical aspect and taking care of patients. But one of the things that we're learning more about and really modeled after the American College of Surgeons Committee on Trauma is the idea of trauma systems and trauma systems expertise and the importance of really integrating and communicating along the continuum of care, the trauma system and the whole PI process that goes along with that. So looking at care, point of injury, en route at each different role of care that feedback loop, you know, which the JTS really represents with uh, the data that we get from the clinical documentation. And so a trauma surgeon, if they're clinically busy, they're great, you know, technician and can take care of blown up people and are really good at damage control, resuscitation and surgery and managing complex wounds and injuries. General surgeons who do that a lot can do that too. What I think the trauma training gets you is more of a especially if you focus on systems, a systems approach to how you integrate, you know, combat casualty care, any system from pre-hospital en route, facility-based care, integrate a performance improvement or medical performance optimization process to feedback on the system and keep getting better. And you know, that's what the JTS has done for you know, almost 20 years now, is use data 
from clinical records and see where the gaps are, what the lessons learned are, what we can be doing better, everything from tourniquets, whole blood, transport time, forward surgical care, critical care nurses, and route nurses, we've learned from you know our experiences in CENTCOM. So as the chief of the Joint Trauma System now, what is on your front burner? What, what are the main concerns that you have? Well, I think everybody's concerned with this Walker dip, which by the way, uh, Admiral, I can't remember his first name, Walker, it's not Cornelius, but a British Admiral, defined the Walker dip in a great paper that describes Walker <clears throat> dip, but it was actually defined also by Dr. DeBakey and by Dr. Churchill and by Dr. Cooley. There's been this uh, you know, punctuated equilibrium of we learn a lot during combat operations. There's a national investment in getting better and learning how to take care of combat casualties. That reciprocates to the civilian world. And then in an interwar period, it becomes more political and less focused on combat casualty care and readiness. And that was described beautifully by Alabaster, by uh, Dr. Alabaster Walker. And so we call it the Walker dip. But the reality is, is that this cycle has gone on for a century, been documented for a century. So, you know, the thing that's on our mind in the foremost is how do we maintain that focus on combat casualty care readiness? How do we be sure that the case fatality rate at the beginning of the next conflict is not much higher than where we ended in Iraq and Afghanistan? And, you know, if you look at our data from the joint trauma system, the first couple years, like about three years, we didn't have a big change in the case fatality rate or the KA rate. Now, that could be because we weren't getting the data collected or other things, but we don't have, you know, three years to act, learn, and adjust. We have to be much faster. So what's on our mind at the Joint Trauma System now is how do we get better at clinical data capture, getting that data into our registry, and rapid cycling that data to inform not just clinical care through performance improvement, but doctrine, organization, training, material requirements, leadership, facilities, personnel, like all those things. I mean, we've adopted the model saving lives with data, and you know, we really mean it. And so we're uh, working really hard to make our registry processes better. We're uh, partnered with JOMIS to improve clinical documentation, and we're trying to get out to exercises to really talk to every level of provider, the importance of you write stuff down, you're helping save a life. Not just because you're doing a good job documenting, taking care of the patient in front yeah. of you, but when it goes into the registry, you know, that data becomes part of the Department of Defense Trauma Registry and combat casualty care data, I mean, I don't think it's a hyperbole to say that it is a national strategic asset. You know, we get better by looking at that data and improving the patient in front of us lives and then the generations to come and then that reciprocity with civilian trauma care as well. I think one of the, the previous speakers this morning talked about it seems like we're at an inflection point where you go through major war, you know, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, you know, OIF, OEF and what's next. You have all the data and you have really good data from you know, the recent conflicts. How do you address things if the next conflict may not be very similar to the last one. Yeah. And the lessons learned from the last one may not apply yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's right. Well, so we have to always remember the lessons learned and not forget them. I think that we like have a lot of lessons forgotten. We've got this whole thing, case records of the joint trauma system where we review cases and so it's all about lessons learned not being forgotten. But how do we get better on the future conflict? Data rapid cycling that data. So if there's large number of casualties, so right now we're pretty slow getting data into our registry. Our registry is very rich and can answer questions, but it can't answer questions super quickly. So by you know really investing in uh, the EMRs that are they're gonna be help us document things like on tablets and on iPads, getting that data into our registry, you know, having analysis. So we've we've also in order to you know optimize that we've created essentially a synthetic data set, we're working on that, so we can come up with algorithms now, as we start getting combat casualty care on the future battlefield, we can you know, act, learn, adjust. Each time somebody puts something in the registry, that becomes part of the process of you know, the medical performance optimization process. Trauma care is delivered, it's written down, it goes into our registry, it gets analyzed, it gets researched, everything else, clinical practice guidelines are developed, trauma care gets delivered. So, you know, I say this when I speak at different meetings or exercises, every single person, if you're gonna be providing care on the battlefield, welcome, you're part of the joint trauma system. You are part of our system and we're all about, you know, getting better, improving lives, 
better return to duty, better support for the operational force. You know, our deployed trauma system and our providers have done like an incredible job. I mean, you know, and, but we have to continue to be agile and adaptive and learn from our mistakes. We owe this to the, you know, people that we support on the battlefield. So we're, we're currently at an operational medicine symposium and, and one of the topics is kind of emerging technology. How are you u- utilizing data technology, artificial intelligence, neural networks? All, yeah, all of it. So <laughs> one of the first things that I did is uh, brought on a team of people so much smarter than I am. Like, like you know, I've been reading a lot about data and OCR and I. Like, uh, like MI, urology and, smart. Yeah, like, like, like <laughs> even more than urology smart, right? <laughs> Um, but, you know, real like data geniuses to figure out, are we going to be using a data fabric? Are we like how we're going to do ETLs, how we're going to use OCR, you know, the optical uh, mm-hmm. capture, uh, artificial intelligence, natural language processing. We're working on that and we're putting our entire system through a pretty rigorous uh, business case analysis and then capabilities based assessment to come up with a way to do this in the future. There's a lot we're going to still have to learn. And, you know, I, I always say, I start a lot of our staff meetings with, you know, the, the John F. Kennedy's quote, the time to fix the roof is when the sun is shining. Right. And so we have this window where the sun is shining. Every once in a while, I feel like there's some clouds coming over the sun and we've got to, like, hurry up. But uh, these are processes that are, they're complicated in any system. And then you add our trauma system and they're complex because our trauma system is kinetic. Hospitals come and go, teams change. These are things that civilian trauma systems don't have to deal with. There's fixed structures, fixed providers. You know, we have a much more of a kinetic environment. So data capture at each role of care and really understanding what was done and how to improve care is hard. And so we're we're leveraging all those tools. Like I said, we've got a team of people way smarter than I am to help figure this out and they understand our strategic direction. So I like your analogy of the you know the sun is shining. We got to fix our house now, but there are some clouds out there. I mean, if we look yeah, at oh yeah. you know Everyone. we Ukraine, look at Ukraine, yeah, for sure. So so Israel. what is the what is the JTS learning from those conflicts that you know we're not actively involved, yeah. um, but we certainly can learn some things. Absolutely, a hundred percent. There's definitely tragedy going on in the world, and uh, the only you know uh, going back to Dr. Mayo's quote, you know, medicine is the only victor in war. Um, And so it is important that we learn from both the Ukrainians and the Israelis on lessons learned. And so there's symposiums that are sponsored by Combat Casualty Care Research Program and Uniformed Services University that we're doing a lot of information exchange. I've gotten a chance to do that a couple of times in uh, Warsaw, Poland. We also do uh, educational courses, the Asset Plus course that was developed by Mark Boyer and USU. We're learning about the importance of pre-hospital care, long transfer times. We've learned about tourniquets, the importance of tourniquet conversion. You know, this is an example of the trauma system, right? So in our trauma system in CENTCOM, we had rapid transport. So anybody could get a tourniquet. It didn't matter. Like you could put a high and tight tourniquet on like a hangnail. And sometimes I feel like some of those wounds didn't need tourniquets, right? We all know that. But our system had rescue built into it and that was rapid transport. You would get to a level of care that, you know, had surgical capability and that tourniquet would be converted. So it wasn't a big deal. Now you look at Ukraine and transport times are almost always more than an hour. You know, there are many hours, sometimes even a day you can't just put a tourniquet on any wound and know that there's a a, a rescue strategy to get that tourniquet off. So, you know, they started seeing some complications with tourniquets and the entire Committee on Tactical Combat Casualty Care listened, really focused on education and training on tourniquet conversion, understanding tourniquet syndrome, which is not anything new. I mean, Wayne Causey standing over there, if you put a tourniquet on something for a long time, you lose the blood flow. When you take the tourniquet down, there's hemodynamic, there's um, physiologic, renal consequences that happen. And so um, we're seeing this play out in Ukraine. So we have been interacting with them. They've also uh, adopted our TC3 guidelines and we're getting information from them. So that reciprocity and supporting the Ukrainians and them also helping us get better. You know, in Israel, they've done a ton of pre-hospital blood. And, uh, you know, they've been able to bring it very close to point of injury. The other thing that they've done, which is, you know, a a practice that we do as well. And so that information sharing, they've been incredibly agile at implementing an electronic medical record within a matter of like two weeks. 
they're a much smaller force. Uh, they have an amazing Surgeon General, and uh, so they were able to do that. So we're, we have an opportunity to, to learn from what's going on and hopefully also share our lessons learned. And, uh, you know, the only victor in war is medicine. So, you know, really being able to save as many lives on any battlefield. So I think one of the things in the past is that the military health system was able to deal with the amount of casualties, whether through the all roles of care, coming to roll fives, taking care of them in our system. Right. In a future conflict, we may see way more right. casualties and it's gonna be a nationwide event. Everyone's gonna be yeah. part of Team America. Yeah. yeah. So how does the JTS, military focused JTS, and I know the American College of Surgeons Committee of Trauma, you know, is talking about the national system. How do yeah. those meld together and how do they collaborate? Yeah, that's a great question. So just on that, you know, the idea of, you know, contested logistics and the challenges we're going to have on the future battlefield, congest contested logistics, uh, return to duty, you know, air deniability, all that becomes congested evacuation. And it happens pre-hospital, roll two, so every place is gonna get congested. So the idea of learning about how do we hold patients longer at every roll of care. In terms of what the next conflict might look like with thousands of casualties a day, it will be an all nation response, just like World War II, just like World War I. The American College of Surgeons has a strategic partnership with the military health system called the Military Health System Strategic Partnership with the American College of Surgeons, or MHS PACS, <laughs> that's currently <coughs> excuse me, led by Brian Eastridge, was uh, previously led by Peggy Knudsen. And so integrating with the COT, many of mil many military members are on the COT in our positions uh, as, uh, you know, Army, Navy, or Air Force state chairs. And so that integrated trauma system, the NASM report from 2016, the National Trauma System, really outlined a nice roadmap for what a national trauma system would look like. And there are lots of efforts going on at the COT with uh, RMOCs, which are regional medical command centers, the NDMS, which is being run by NORTHCOM, implemented through HHS, North, the DOD, uh, the ACS. So there's lots of efforts. I mean, I, so here's the thing, like, we don't have this all figured out. If it happens tomorrow, we're gonna figure it out because we're gonna have no choice. But the more systems we can put in place now, and really those systems, you know, foundational to that is communication. And I think we're doing a good job at that, you know, communicating across organizations, communicating between the, you know, JTS and the American College of Surgeons, the MHS and the American College of Surgeons and the COT, but we've got a ways to go. Trauma is obviously in the joint trauma system name. Um, but there's also disease, non-battle injury. Yeah. How do you track what, how yeah. that's being treated? You're asking a lot of good questions. It's like, you know, we, you've been trying to get this with us to talk for a long time, so I feel like you've had these questions planned. Yes. <laughs> that's a great question. So NBI is huge. In the conflicts in CENTCOM, trauma was the number one threat, right? But in the past, it was MBI, a disease and non-battle injury. So we do capture battle in, or non-battle injury in the registry, but in terms of disease, once we get our processes down, rapid data integration into the registry, we 100% plan on expanding to all military health threats, military health threats, you know, whether it's heat, infectious disease, you know, trench foot, I hope we never see anything like that again, or whatever it is, but it's that same process of act, deliver trauma care, uh, put it into, write it down, put it into the registry, learn, and then adjust by looking at CPGs and adjusting the data and going back to delivering trauma care. So once we get our processes down, I think we'll be able to apply it to other military health threats. So you've had a distinguished career in military medicine and it's been a career, so. Yeah, surprisingly it has. What, I never, ever thought it would be this long. So, so, so I mean, tell me what, what kept a trauma surgeon in uniform? What, what, what made you decide to, you know, ignore the siren song of making a zillion dollars in the civilian yeah, sector and saying, yeah. I'm gonna stay with military My medicine? My husband asks me that all the time. Yeah, so, um, I mean, it's the mission. And, you know, I believe that guys and gals in uniform deserve like the best care that's available. And I think that everybody that's still in uniform and actually a lot of people out of uniform that still support the mission, you know, really, really believe that. And if I thought I could be as influential outside the military, I would be out. Uh, but I think that, you know, it's really important that, uh, you know, at, at this point and this job as a JTS chief, you know, um, 
you know, staying in uniform, seeing this through, seeing our new registry development. There's challenges being in uniform, and it's not just the, you know, it's not just the administrative stuff and the P test, whatever your analysis or what they're called, you know, like, but the, but there are, there are, it is challenging, and I, there's challenges on the civilian side too. I mean, I've had a chance to interact with a lot of civilian hospitals, but you know, it's a mission. It's the people that we serve. I mean, there's no greater population, and uh, you know, I'm committed to it. We've been speaking with Colonel Jennifer Gurney on this combined partnership between Wardox and OpMed TV. Jen, thanks for <laughs> thanks welcome. for your time today. Thank you for tuning in to this special episode of War Docs, made possible by a partnership with the Defense Strategies Institute's OpMed TV. To stay connected with Team War Docs, visit our website at wardocspodcast.com. Follow us on social media for updates and subscribe to our War Docs YouTube channel for more engaging content. Your support helps us continue to document the experiences and contributions of military medicine professionals as we honor the legacy and preserve the history of military medicine for the next generation.